Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second webinar in our Community Education Forum series. My name is Shelley Redman, and I'm the CEO of the Huntington Society of Canada. It's certainly been a challenging few months. While we've had to postpone our national conference, obviously due to COVID-19, we are very proud to be able to offer three virtual CAFs over the course of this year. We enjoyed a successful event back in May when HD community member Natalie Marnica spoke to us about self-care for the caregiver, and we thank Natalie again for doing such an incredible job. While we know that their virtual CEF isn't the same as gathering in person at our national conference, these forums do allow HSC to offer important updates in a safe manner during a pandemic. All of us at HRC are hopeful for the future because of our dedicated HD community. Our wonderful volunteers and donors, and of course the individuals and families affected by HD who continue to give back in any way that they can. Our community also includes researchers dedicated to finding a therapy for HD, and that's precisely why we're here today, to learn more about what's going on in HD research. So before we get started, I'd like to extend a sincere thanks to Roche and Novartis for their general sponsorship of today's events. Their support makes webinars like these uh, possible, so thank you very much. And now we're going to review a few housekeeping items so that our event runs smooth. You have joined the presentation by listening through your computer speaker uh, system by default today. If you prefer to listen to audio over the telephone, just select phone call on the audio setting of your control panel and the dial-in dial -in information will be displayed. You can also submit text questions at any time by typing them into the questions box of the control panel, and we will address them later on during the presentation. So without further ado, let's bring on our speakers for today. With multiple Huntington lowering trials in progress and more on the way, it's a time of great progress and excitement in research to develop and test new drugs to fight Huntington disease. But lots of new therapies means more research and terminology that could confuse and overwhelm and more hype that could lead to some disappointment. Dr. Jeff Carroll is a scientist studying HD as an associate professor at Western Washington University. He trained as a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Marcy McDonald at Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School, after completing his PhD under the supervision of Michael Hayden at UBC in Vancouver. He has worked for many years on Huntington lowering experiments in most models. His recent work involves understanding what the Huntington protein's normal roles are in cells, particularly with respect to DNA damage and repair. As well as conducting research, Jeff is a member of an HD family uh, and himself carries the mutation which causes the disease. Ed Wilde is Professor of Neurology at University College London, Associate Director of UCL's Huntington's Disease Centre, and a consultant neurologist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. Ed has worked on HD since 2005 and leads a team focusing on clinical trials of new HD treatments and studying cerebral spinal fluid to understand HD. He's authored seven book chapters and over 80 peer-reviewed scientific pub publications and leads the Global HD Clarity Study. Ed was a recipient of HSC's 2012 Michael Wright Community Leadership Award. As editors of HD Buzz, Jeff and Ed are here to explain what's going on, what's coming soon, what it all means, and where to direct your excitement and energy in order to help in the fight against HD. So please welcome Jeff Car Dr. Jeff Carroll and Professor Ed Wild. Hi everyone. Hope you can see me and hear me. Uh, and I'm just going to leave it on this uh, introductory slide briefly. I want you to take out your phones, take a photo of this slide showing me as a professor and Jeff Carroll as a mere doctor because it, it's fairly certain that this will be the only HSC presentation where that's the case. I'm sure Jeff will be a full professor very soon. 
but I just thought it might be nice for the uh, 140 of you on the call to uh, celebrate this moment with me. Can you hear me, Jeff? Yes, I'm really thrilled about it. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ed, I'm the English one and the professor. They call me the professor. Um, I, I've always, I was promoted a month ago, so I'm still kind of easing myself into it. Um, I'm uh, joining you from my apartment in London. This is not a real fire. Um, it's a YouTube video, but I thought I, one likes to go for a little atmosphere on these occasions and I'll let Jeff introduce himself. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Jeff. Uh, this is Argos, my uh, assistant today who may be barking at any random point um, that there might be a possibility that he could get some food. So I apologize ahead of time for the interruptions. My 14 year old kids are very unlikely to interrupt since they're turning into like golem like wraiths in the room and haven't left for days and are just playing Minecraft. So we will, won't be annoyed except for by this guy. And what an excellent choice of words because uh, as you know, Jeff, Gollum is a character in the uh, J.R. Tolkien series, uh, Lord of the Rings, and uh, Jeff and I are both huge fans of that franchise, uh, perhaps me a little more than Jeff. Uh, I don't remember seasoned, you asking me if I was a fan, actually. <laughs> I just assumed it's true. Seasoned Ed and Jeff uh, watchers will know that I usually put the slides together and then um, tell Jeff at the last minute what the theme of the talk is going to be. So. Um, Lord of the Rings has been a great source of comfort for me during lockdown and the whole COVID hiccup. Um, so we, I've called the talk A Light in Dark Places when all other lights go out, uh, because it's about living through tough times and finding hope wherever you can, and then doing what you can to multiply that hope into something that uh, creates a brighter future. And uh, the whole world is having to do that now uh, because we're in the middle of a, an unprecedented viral pandemic. But HD families have been doing that for as long as anyone can remember, you know, and I think I'm not going to trivialize the pandemic, but I think to most people having to face a life threatening danger and get on with your everyday life as best as you can and try and contribute to the, the, the hope of a better future with the help of science is really something that HD families have been doing since long before Jeff and I were involved. Um, and so, um, the fact that everyone is having to do that now with COVID, um, uh, you know, is really, I think, uh, this is the stuff that the HD community has been doing for a long time. And sure, now, now we have to worry about HD and the pandemic, but the same drive and determination will get us through all of these obstacles if we stick at it. So I found that very um, uplifting, except for the part where you called the global pandemic a hiccup. Yes. That is my classic English understatedness. It is the literary figure known as Lytotes. Uh, but we didn't get into that. <laughs> You'll see that I'm showing our, our audience a uh, repeating GIF, which they will all recognize as, I mean, of course, it's Niagara Falls because the convention was supposed to be in Niagara. We're supposed to be in Niagara now, guys. It wasn't to be. Uh, this is, of course, from the movie Superman, the original Superman movie. and. Uh, I had the pleasure of visiting Niagara after a trip to Toronto, an HD trip to Toronto, nearly 10 years ago. And of course, I couldn't help but uh, recreate. You, you can see the wheels turning in my head to recreate this seminal moment. Um, and of course, I did climb over the railings and I did pretend to let go. But it's miles away from the waterfall and beneath me was just a stretch of lawn. It was just grass. So there was no danger. And um, but don't try this. But anyway, this is to demonstrate that I would like to be in Niagara again, but I'm not, but I'm ha happy to be joining you all across Canada. Should we talk about some science? Yes. So this is Lady Galadriel. Uh, she's the queen of the elves and halfway through the quest, she gives to Frodo, the um, hobbit, uh, a glass file containing the light of the, the star, which guides the elves. And um, she says to him, it will shine brighter when night is about you. May it be a light to you in dark places when all other lights go out. And I think that's a little bit what science is. So I want to give, I'm not saying I'm the queen of the elves, that's for other people to say, but I we would like to give to you a small vial of light to carry with you. And when things are dark, uh, look at the vial of science and it will light your way. That's the plan anyway. So Lady Galadriel is gonna return at various points during our talk and give us some um, guiding wisdom. And the first thing she wants to say is that 
despite the COVID pandemic, some cool things that were already set in motion have continued to go well. It's also worth mentioning that we'll be talking about research that involves Roche and Novartis. And when we put the talk together, we didn't know that Roche and Novartis were sponsoring the seminar. So they would have got mentioned anyway, but it's good that they're sponsoring the seminar. They're not paying us. So um, last year, um, this paper came out in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, it was probably the biggest paper to come out in HD for a while. And it was the results of the first Huntington lowering trial. So the first trial of a drug um, trying to reduce production of the harmful protein Huntington that is the cause of every case of Huntington's disease. And in this article, we reported the results of the first trial. And that was a trial that began in 2015. You may remember at the end of 2017, um, there were lots of headlines just before Christmas, almost exactly uh, three years ago. Um, and this was when the first results were shared with the uh, media and with the HD community. And this is the that program from the headlines in 2017 is the same as the paper in 2019 and is the same as the program that is still going on, which we're going to give you an update on. And we still think it's the most exciting and it's certainly the most advanced Huntington lowering program currently happening. A little bit on terminology. We used to talk about gene silencing. So the idea of there's a gene that's doing harm, we want to silence it. And then there was a big debate about whether we wanted to silence it or reduce the volume slightly. Uh, and so uh, instead now we just call it Huntington lowering, but those are those two things are basically the same in, in the case of Huntington's disease anyway. Lots of things have changed their names over the years. So the company that first developed the drug we're gonna talk about was initially called Isis Pharmaceuticals. And then in about 2014, they changed their name to Ionis and nobody knows why. Um, later on, they uh, sold the drug or they, they handed the development of the drug over to Roche, which is the Swiss company and its US slash Canadian arm, which is called Genentech. So Roche and Genentech are the same thing and they now are developing the drug. Along the way, uh, the drug has changed its name. The drug is, it belongs to a family of drugs called antisense oligonucleotides, which basically means a short stretch of designer DNA. And because that's a mouthful, we call them ASO drugs. I'm gonna show you uh, an instructional video, um, which will explain everything in a moment. So don't worry too much about remembering all of this. The name of the drug has changed, as I say, since the program began. It was initially called HTTRX, HTT is the uh, abbreviation that we give to the Huntington gene. RX means treatment. And then when Roche and Genentech bought the drug, RG, they called it RG6042. And then in February of this year, they decided it was time for the drug to be given a name. So they decided to call it Tommy Nursen, because what else are you going to call it? Uh, to be fair, Nursen is the ending that you have to give your drug if it's one of these ASO drugs made from DNA. Tommy, nobody knows why uh, they called it Tommy, but it's possible that someone at Rush was a fan of this old uh, musical about a kid who plays pinball, um, uh, starring Roger Daltrey of The Who. Uh, the, the truth behind that is not yet revealed. But anyway, the drug is called Tommy Nursen. And I'm now gonna show you a video that explains everything you need to know about Huntington lowering and where we're up to with the uh, program. Here it comes. Brace yourselves. It's a good one. After promising trials of an experimental new drug for Huntington's disease, researchers hope that currently untreatable brain diseases could soon become treatable, including other neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, motor neuron disease and Alzheimer's. We wanted to share this exciting research with you. And there's a new toy flying off the shelves that can help. So enter a world inside your cells and play with the awesome nano machines inside. The original portable protein action figures by Labsbro. Spark into action with ATP synthase. Pump out that potassium with Nicotpase. These fully operational action figures represent just a couple of the thousands of tiny machines in your cells. Those nanomachines are the proteins that our body's systems depend on for their structure and function. 
And now you can build your own nano machines with the all new Protein Code Builder Set. Everything you need to go from gene to protein. Extreme. First, look inside the nucleus to find the DNA code, the gene, to make your new nano machine. Lock it down and activate transcription. DNA to RNA is the way. Whoa, messenger RNA. Transcription made a copy of that DNA code in mRNA, which is swell, as that can leave the nucleus and travel to your protein factory, the ribosome. That's where you Oh, go on, kid. Exactly! Now put on your high-tech 3D glasses to hear expert commentary from our NanoWorld Cyber Guide. Translation turns that mRNA code into a protein. It matches every three letters of code to a specific building block, an amino acid, which folds together into your new protein's unique shape. Congratulations, you have made a tau protein. You can repeat this process for any gene. 1. Find the DNA code for the protein you want to make. 2. Transcribe that DNA code into messenger RNA. 3. Translate the mRNA into protein. That's the basics of gene expression. Wow! Gene expression. Gene expression. Tau and Rad are two more of those thousands of nanomachine proteins that keep your body in tip-top condition. They're all made through gene expression. But if faults occur in the code, then disease can develop and threaten the nano world of your cells. Oh no, mutant Huntington. Oh no indeed. This is a faulty protein, Huntington. And buildup of this sticky protein can cause Huntington's disease. But where is it coming from? A mutation in the Huntington gene, location chromosome 4. Hello, are you even listening to me? <laughs> Warning, a buildup of mutant Huntington protein is toxic to neurons in the brain, impacting memory and movement. The code to make the mutant Huntington protein comes from a mutant Huntington gene. If you can slow the production of the Huntington protein, you could slow the onset of Huntington's disease. I know what to do. Join the mission to break the enemy code and fix your nano world with the all new Nano Machines Code Breakers Edition. I need to stop mutant Huntington getting made. Good idea. The mutant Huntington gene is turned into mRNA that carries that mutant Huntington code to the ribosome, where it's translated into mutant Huntington protein. If you could stop the messenger, you could stop the mutant Huntington protein being made. I'll design a new code to attach to the mRNA. She's right. The code needs to be the exact opposite to the mutant Huntington mRNA to bind to it. It's called an antisense oligonucleotide, and it will bind specifically to its target, locking it up so the ribosome won't be able to read it and make any more mutant Huntington protein. But what's this? The kid has gone slime crazy! There's mutant Huntington mRNA yeah. everywhere! Oh. Yeah. You'll need a lot of antisense to mop up all that mutant mRNA. Done it! Eat antisense! You've done it! You've stopped that sticky mutant Huntington protein from being made! A recent small-scale human trial of this drug, led by a team at UCL Institute of Neurology, showed that the treatment can lower the concentration of the mutant Huntington protein in patients with Huntington's disease. You defeated me this time, but you still need a large-scale clinical trial to see if it actually works. Researchers are already on it, and the clinical trial results are coming in 2022. <laughs> Similar products being trialed for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and motor neuron disease, each toy sold separately, 3D glasses not included. Yeah! May the Van Der Waals force be with you. Okay, we're back. Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that, um, which I think explains uh, Huntington lowering much better than Jeff or I, than even Jeff or I could 
so that video was made by my university, UCL, along with the, um, uh, the uh, National Institute for Health uh, Research, NIHR. So if you want to look at it again, just go to YouTube and search for Nano Machines NIHR, um, and you can eat antisense anytime you like. So uh, that's the principles, and that's sort of talked about the trial. The, the trial that was in the video is the one that we've been talking about, the Ionis Rush Tommy Nursen program. Um, and Jeff is now going to fill you in on what the trial showed and where we are now. Uh, yeah, first, just as somebody who watched a lot of cartoons in the 80s um, and subsequently learned a lot of biology, that that video is like kicking for me on multiple levels. I, I don't get sick of it. It's fantastic. Um, so um, just a brief reminder of like how these things work. Um, uh, not to take away from uh, <laughs> the amazing uh, young women on the video, um, but you know, since 1993, we've known the exact genetic cause of every form of Huntington's disease, and we have the luxury of knowing that every Huntington's disease patient um, ultimately got the disease because of a single mutant gene um, that we've known the location of, except for more than more than 20 years. So that gene uh, is used as instructions, um, and our cells are careful with our DNA, right? We don't want to have our busy, noisy, chemically challenging protein making machinery next to our DNA because that's if you mess up DNA, that's how you get cancer. So we have this process of taking the instructions from DNA and carrying it out to the busy uh, cytoplasm of the cell where, where machines are made. So that, that process of transcription, of sort of jotting a recipe on a, on a little card, if you will, um, is called transcription. And so the DNA is read and translated into a language called RNA. And that RNA ultimately uh, is exported out to the parts of the cell um, that, where the protein making machinery lives and protein is made. And another reminder, the vast majority of Huntington patients um, have two copies of the Huntington gene. Um, and uh, well, all people do, um, but in the case of Huntington's patients, one of those has this mutant copy and one of them doesn't. And the instructions on that mutant copy of the gene are used to make a protein that has different properties than the, than the normal Huntington protein or the, un, the, the, I'm not supposed to say normal anymore, <laughs> but, but I feel like I might be allowed to anyway. Um, so the real goal is to get rid of this mutant Huntington protein um, and, and getting rid of the regular one is, is sort of not necessarily the direct goal. And ultimately, it's the long term effects of having that mutant Huntington protein around that we think is actually toxic to our brain cells. And that, that toxicity leads to the symptoms that we now call Huntington's disease. So we have this big elaborate process for taking the instructions in our DNA transcribing it into RNA and bringing that out and translating it into a protein, which again is what we think is the bad guy. Any one of those points, including at the mRNA, for example, um, which is the target of ASOs, we can, we think we can intervene, block the process. And I should say that one of the things we'll tell you about today is actually probably have to update this and see if those girls are still into acting because now there's new ways to interfere with a, a, even an earlier stage of this process, which we'll talk about towards the end of this talk. So here we're focused on ASOs because they're in the clinical trial already. Um, but there are new emerging ways to interfere at even an earlier stage of that. Um, so stay tuned for that. So again, uh, the goal of this creepily named uh, drug, or at least creepy when Ed puts that picture next to it, Tom Anderson, is to go in, bind to the RNA um, of Huntington and to lead to its degradation. And as far with no RNA, you make no protein. Um, and since we think that's ultimately what causes HD, that's obviously a, a goal that everyone's excited about, including us. The results of the trial that we uh, showed the title of are shown here. These are the key findings. So this is the levels of mutant Huntington protein, the sticky gummy protein we want to get rid of, can be measured in the spinal fluid. Um, and what you can see across different doses is that people who got more of a, or, sorry, a higher dose of the drug had less levels of mutant Huntington in their protein. And that happened over time as they received more drug. That's exactly the kind of pattern that you would like to see, right? That, if you give more drug, you get better reduction of the protein, and that it, that builds up over time. So this pattern really gave us a lot of hope that the drug was doing exactly what it was designed to do. So it's expanded rapidly. So I think when Ed and I first started talking about this, we were thinking about planning this first study of these incredibly brave volunteers, which was 46 people initially. Um, and we want to start small intentionally, right? Because you want to have a few people exposed to a risk. This is like this is, I was gonna say this is rocket science. This is harder than rocket science. This is complicated stuff and we don't wanna hurt people. So we start with small trials intentionally, scale up the drug, make sure those folks are okay and then open it up to more people. So the people who were in that first initial um, phase one study, uh, the, the safety study, uh, were given the option and most, most are all transitioned to what's called an open label extension, which meant at the end of the trial, the people who had been getting placebo or dummy drug treatment 
were switched to active drug and everybody continued to get it who wanted it. And so those people give us a first chance to have a longer term look at safety and other things. In parallel, as Roche came on, they started another natural history study, which looked um, at 100 patients and tracked their HD symptoms over time. And those people were also offered the option to transfer into the open label extension. So with that gives us another set of people who are getting this drug. The ultimately really exciting trial, the, the one that actually has enough people in it to tell if HD symptoms are better, not just is the drug safe, is gonna involve 800 people in that trial called Generation HD1. Um, we have some exciting updates about and we'll talk about in a second. So if you if you look at the kind of the whole bucket of all of these subtrials that have happened over time, we're up to about a thousand people um, will be dosed with Tom and Erson, um, uh, uh, some for quite a while, the people who have participated in the first phase study. So the Generation HD uh, one study uh, is, is testing two different treatment regimes, which is really kind of interesting. One is bi-monthly treatment with drug. Um, and then we're, they're being compared to people who are only treated every um, four months. Um, and so that, that was an exciting change to the trial design that Roche introduced um, when presumably based on evidence they have that we might be able to get away with less frequent injections. And, you know, while all of us in the community would sort of do anything to have an effective treatment for HD and intrathecal, you know, a spinal fluid injection is not trivial. And if we can have fewer of those, that's great. And so it's fantastic they're trying that out. And then, of course, as with any trial, there has to be a placebo group or a group getting a dummy treatment uh, to compare uh, the people on active drug to. So the exciting news about the um, Generation HD1, I, I'll tell you, um, <laughs> I had weird reactions to the pandemic happening. You know, I think people worried about their kids and families and stuff. They'll show you how weird I am. It's like, as soon as I heard about this, this pandemic, I thought, oh my God, the ASO trial. And I thought, you know, this is gonna be a big problem. And I'm sure it did involve a lot of problems for a lot of people. But remarkably, only a month or two into the you know serious lockdowns across Europe and, and North America where these trials are happening, Roche announced that the trial was fully enrolled. So the 800 and whatever people from around the world who are gonna fill up this trial to tell us if this drug works, fully enrolled. What's really exciting about that is it's a two-year trial. So once the, once the last person enrolls, you can sort of set the clock for when the readout of the trial will be. And of course, we don't know the exact day we'll get, well, Roche does, we don't know the exact day we'll get the results, but uh, you know, set your clocks for spring 2022 and one way or the other, um, we're going to find out about what, how this drug uh, works on the level of symptoms, not just on the level of um, doing what it's supposed to do, which is obviously already pretty amazing. So right, said, it's, it's, just sorry, sorry, just to chime in there, Jeff, it's worth it's worth mentioning that, you know, the reason this trial is happening is because we don't know whether the drug works to slow progression. What we know from the first trial is that it reduces production of the Huntington protein. And that was an incredible result. It had never been done before, and it was exactly what we wanted to do. Um, what we don't know is whether doing that, lowering production of the protein, will actually slow progression of the disease. If we knew it, we'd be able to license the drug already, but we simply don't know it. We still don't know whether this drug is amazing or neutral or harmful. And, you know, any of those three possibilities could still be the outcome. So we've illustrated this slide with fireworks and it will be good news, whatever the news. There's great news, uh, which would be the drug working to slow progression. But it's still good news when you hear the result of any big trial um, that's been designed and well run and has enough people in it to give you the answer one way or another. We need to know either way. We'd like it to be great, but if it's not great, we also want to know that. We want to discover the truth of this drug, whether the drug works. And that's true of every trial. We want to discover the truth of whether it's good, bad, or neutral. Back to you, Jeffrey. Are we going backwards? Uh, we're going to talk about, oh, actually, oh, I'll carry on. So this <laughs> basic idea of interrupting Fine, the Finely tuned machine line. here. <laughs> As you can see, we haven't had a great deal of opportunity to practice this talk one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, it's been about a year since we saw each other. Um, so, uh, yeah, there are other ways of accomplishing the same thing. We want to interrupt the protein production line. Um, there's actually another ASO program that's already happening, and you've probably heard of it. Some of you are probably participants in it. If you live in Toronto or Vancouver or are patients in those centres, you may be um, a participant in one of these precision HD trials run by WAVE Life Sciences. That's doing basically exactly the same thing. The drug is exactly the same basic principle. It's a stretch of designer DNA. You inject it into the spine and its job is to switch off production of the protein. 
but the WAVE life sciences trial has a twist. Each of these two drugs is tailor-made to target um, the gene in such a way that it will only reduce production of the mutant gene. It won't, um, it won't affect the production of the protein that comes from the healthy or regular or normal, as Jeff called it, copy of the gene. So that's why they're calling it precision, because it, 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 it should, if it works, it should give you more of the stuff we want to do, which is reducing mutant protein production, and less of the stuff we would prefer to avoid if we could, um, which is the, the regular protein production. Now, um, it, it's slightly complicated as to how these drugs work, but they're basically, they're not targeting the mutation directly. They target little single letter spelling differences that, that sometimes travel alongside the mutation uh, in certain groups of people when the uh, gene is passed from one generation to the next. And that's why we need multiple uh, drugs. Um, WAVE announced just before Christmas last year, or just before New Year, um, that uh, they had top line data from one of the two trials, the Precision HD2 trial, uh, and what they, what they shared was that they had successfully achieved a mild, but what they called significant reduction in mutant Huntington protein production in the patients who were on active drug as opposed to placebo. Now, if you look at the figures here, what you'll see is that they've reduced it by about 12% compared to the people who were on the placebo treatment. Now, it, whereas if you go back to the Roche program, the people on the high doses in that trial, their protein production was reduced by 50 or 60%. So the wave drugs currently are not producing the same degree of reduction. But the first thing is you may not need to produce the same total reduction if you're focusing on the mutant protein. And the second is, well, WAVE is now um, already going into the trial, both arms of the trial, with higher doses of drug. Um, and actually, a similar thing happened partway through the uh, Ionis Roche program. It's, it's basically how we develop drugs, is you, you test them, see what results you get, and then if it's safe to do so, you can test higher doses and keep testing higher doses until you get a dose that gives you the kind of effect that you're looking for. So the WAVE program, had to extend um, uh, in order to add more doses. And of course that ended up hitting the pandemic, but that program is still going on. Um, and uh, we don't know, quite know when we'll receive updates, but we expect updates on that program pretty soon. So that's ASOs, and those are the DNA drugs injected into the spine. Wouldn't it be cool uh, if there was a treatment that you, could, you, that you only had to have once though, um, a lifelong treatment, so a single treatment early on and then your Huntington production or mutant Huntington production is reduced for the rest of your life. That is the goal of so-called viral gene therapies represented here by a drill because the downside to these, the upside is long lasting, potentially lifelong treatment. The downside is they have to be injected directly into the brain. And over to you, Jeff, to explain how that works. I was just thinking it's kind of interesting. It's a bit like some of these new coronavirus vaccines. Um, you know, there was there was an old school way of delivering actual copies of the virus itself. And some of the new exciting results that have been announced with those um, have done a similar thing to what we're talking about here, where you deliver genetic instructions to the body. So the body makes its own copies of the viral proteins. And that turns out to be a much faster development thing. Anyway, interesting yeah. parallels. But the, the, the bottom line of, of how these approaches work, these so-called gene therapy approaches, is that um, so recall that, you know, the, the every gene uh, codes, uh, for, uh, the genes like the Huntington gene, excuse me, code for protein, and there's this intermediate step of RNA. Um, and so ASOs come in and block the RNA directly, um, but there are other ways of, of, of um, blocking mRNA. Um, and some of those can, are, uh, can be uh, in the form of, delivered in the form of DNA, which carries the instructions to make one of these molecules that blocks the RNA. So the, we can use a harmless virus um, that's been stripped of its normal viral protein, so it won't do this normal viral stuff, and that virus can deliver instructions and turn the cells that the virus infects into sort of little factories for actually making uh, a molecule that's a bit like an ASO, we won't go into the details of, of the chemistry of it, but basically molecules that are sort of ASO-like and that they bind to and block specific RNAs, in this case, again, the Huntington RNA, and then lead to its degradation. And with no RNA, you get no protein, just like ASOs. So it's a bit like ASOs, but it's a bit like if you could trick brain cells into becoming their own ASO factories and making these drugs. And in theory, we know that these things, um, or in practice, we know they can last for years. In theory, they may be as much as lifelong, 
um, because these viruses are very good at get, getting into cells like brain cells. So there are several companies interested in this in HD. I think the most advanced, it's fair to say, is a company called Unicure. Um, Unicure's shown, done a lot of, uh, you can imagine that the barrier here is really high, right? You're gonna give a single injection, it's gonna last for people's whole life. The safety barrier has to be really high because you can't go in and turn these things off the way that you can with a pill or an ASO where you can stop delivering it. So Unicure has done a really extensive set of pre what we call preclinical experiments, so animal experiments before you go into humans. Um, so for example, they use pigs, which may sound a bit funny, but pigs have brains that are shaped quite a bit like ours. Um, I work on mice, mouse brains don't look very much like human brains. And so it's, it's relatively easy to get a gene therapy to go everywhere in a mouse brain, uh, much harder in a larger brain. And, and Unicure did a lot of work and published some beautiful work uh, from, a, from pigs. Um, and they showed that they could reduce levels of Huntington, they could detect in the CSF, which is the kind of way that we're gonna wanna do it. So really beautiful proof of concept that there, this approach could work. And based on all of this, all of these sets of many years of experiments, Unicure announced a trial. Um, and in fact, um, more recently has announced that they've actually been allowed to enroll the first studies, the first patients in their trial. So you can imagine a gene therapy, again, very high bar for safety. So the first patient gets enrolled, they get injected, and then there's a wait. And then there's an independent set of experts that look at those patients and say, okay, you know, that, that patient seems healthy, we can move on to the next. And so I've forgotten exactly what the number is now. It's somewhere between two and four patients have actually been injected with these Unicure drugs. It's four, yeah. So they yeah. they passed that hurdle of getting past the first injection, which is obviously a really high bar. So that's a really exciting advance. And so there are people out there in the world walking around whose brains are making instructions to degrade the Huntington protein or RNA uh, and 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 will for a long time, we hope. And Unicure, that the, the update you're seeing here is just is a, a month old. So um, they you know we're getting pretty regular updates and. And the trials prog progressing, you know, as well as could possibly be expected, especially considering we're in a pandemic. So the next thing to say is that, um, uh, despite the fact that things are, are weird at the moment, science continues and continues to discover new and cool uh, things. So one of those things uh, is that we are discovering new insights into the genetics of Huntington's disease. And if you've given a blood for the Enroll HD study or the cohort study or the registry study, chances are that your blood is one of the ones that was studied in the biggest uh, genetic project in Huntington's disease so far, the GEM HD consortium. And this um, looked at uh, uh, blood from nearly 10,000 people and basically found what they were looking for was things other than the Huntington gene, differences, single little genetic differences between people, where if you have one letter rather than another, your Huntington's disease begins sooner or later than expected. Um, and uh, lo and behold, this study turned up a ton of these candidate genetic modifiers, as they're called. Um, and that's useful in itself, because each of these uh, little genetic changes is a potential lead uh, because if we could, if you find something, a gene that slows the progression of HD, if you could capture the effects of that gene and put it in a pill, well, then you have a treatment for Huntington's disease. But there was even more to it than that, because when the scientists, the geneticists behind this work, looked at the patterns in these genes, what they found was that nearly all of them were involved in DNA repair. So what this is, is a set of genes that, that encodes or is, uh, carries instructions to make a set of machines whose job is repairing the DNA. And as you can imagine, the DNA sometimes gets damaged. Uh, in fact, hundreds of times a day, the DNA gets damaged. And it's the job of this DNA repair machinery to put it back together. Sometimes it goes wrong. And how we know this is that if you look at someone like, uh, say, let, let's say Jeff, Jeff had an HD test and it was found that he had 42 CAG repeats in his HD gene, which is abnormal, but it's towards the low end of abnormal. It's an, a, a positive test but sort of low positive. Um, and the higher uh, that number is, on average, the earlier the onset of HD. But looking at the brains of people who've died, some of them who had a blood test showing 42 CAGs, some of the brain cells may have had 50 or 60 or, e or even more CAG repeats in individual cells in the brain. So this CAG- You can't have my brain. Say again? You can't have my brain yet. No, but soon. No, not too soon. I don't want it. I don't want your brain. <laughs> Keep it. Um, so uh, yeah, we call this somatic instability. The blood, the the number stays the same in blood, but in the brain it tends to grow. And the chances are that these differences in DNA repair are to blame. The idea basically being that if the DNA repair is a little bit wonky, 
it can accidentally add extra CAGs when it's repairing the DNA. And of course, that is a lead that could be very useful because if we could come up with a pill that sort of return the DNA repair machinery back to normal um, or towards a healthier end, well, then potentially your, your, your brain could stay, you know, the CAGs in your brain may never grow. And that could mean that you could substantially delay the onset of Huntington's disease. Uh, another uh, set of work that's now just recently been published and that was presented um, by Sarah Tabrisi um, at the last time we were able to get together and hear science together um, was to me a really interesting and exciting study, the HDES study, which uh, our young adults um, from HD families were studied in really exhaustive detail. Because a lot of us have wondered, you know, with all these ASO drugs and all these other drugs that we're talking about, what's the right time to intervene, right? You know, is is the brain ever um, uh, of HD mutation carrier ever normal, you know, normal enough that, you know, you could affect, you could hope to to, to have a treatment um, and maybe prevent or slow down the, the onset of HD. Um, and what was interesting was that these young adults who were studied, um, I think the average age was like late 20s. Is that right, Ed? Um, yeah. They um, they did an exhaustive set of studies and they found that these people, you know, with the most sensitive tests, there were very few changes that could be detected um, in the brain function of these people, suggesting that even people with the HD mutation, their brains are functioning pretty normally. Um, however, even in that window where brain function was really normal, there was blood tests that we could use as potential markers of, of, of what we think builds to the progression that could be um, associated with neurodegeneration and, and eventual development of HD. So there's sort of this sweet spot of a window of time when the brain is functioning really well, but there's already blood tests that could potentially be used. Um, and I think this is a really exciting advance um, in the sense that it might set us up to do uh, the kind of trial we all want to do, which is a preventative trial, right? To stop people from getting HD or to delay their onset. Cool, so the other thing to think about uh, is that sometimes things don't go as we would like. Uh, and this has clearly been a year of uh, things not going quite as we have planned, but clouds do have silver linings. And when a challenge comes along, it's the job of science to try and make the best of it and to learn from it. So this is my HD pandemic uh, pros and cons checklist. So there's a few bad things about the pandemic. The first thing is everything is awful. Uh, this is a scary disease and it's completely changed everyone's lives and broadly speaking, not for the better. It's particularly bad for people with HD who are already facing enough challenges and now have this pandemic to worry about and additional insecurities. Um, everyone, Jeff mentioned it, I, my first thought was what about the trials? We're worried about possible impact on research. However, there are things in the plus column. This pandemic will end last week. Wait, no, it was this week. It was four days ago. Uh, we have the first news that one of the vaccines yeah, it seems to be hugely effective at reducing transmission of this. And I, I read today that Canadians, the Canadian government has purchased 12 doses per person, which is six times more doses than you actually need. Uh, so can we have some vaccine, please? No, apparently there's enough to go around. And um, there'll be other vaccines as well. I'm a participant in another vaccine trial. I, I, I'm, there's every reason to believe that the vaccines will end this pandemic in the spring of 2021. I'd be surprised if they don't. So it will end. Um, what's more, between now and then, we know what to do to stop transmission of the virus. It's been very well studied. And thanks to very early sharing of science during the pandemic, we learned very quickly what things work and what things don't work. And therefore, um, uh, there's lots of progress already being made in terms of treatments of, for, for coronavirus. It's a really good example. And the research that isn't carrying on, so a lot of research did carry on, all of the trial activity carried on everywhere that it could, and all of the patients, for instance, at our site at UCL, who were already in the trial, uh, carried on being dosed right through the pandemic, even when the hospitals were nearly closed to everything else. Um, so lots of trial activity continues, and we can work together to minimize the impact. Um, the second wave, well, is less bad than the first wave. Uh, that in, in the UK, uh, many fewer people are dying in the second wave because we're better at handling the virus. So every cloud does have a silver lining. And what's more, science is the exit strategy. It will be science that gets us out of the pandemic. It will be science that lifts the cloud of HD. And Jeff is going to talk about another example now from the Roche program of a surprise that came along that we're sort of trying to figure out. 
Yeah, and just to talk about how not everything goes as you know as you planned on the whiteboard when you started the trial, right? Things things uh, happen during trials that are surprising and that lead us to have to to try to understand things better. So you know this is the key data that um, we showed you already that you know with a chronic uh, treatment with these ASOs either every month or every uh, two months. Um, you got really significant reduction of um, mutant Huntington detected in the spinal fluid. Brilliant, okay, success, that's great. However, there was a little bit of a complication. They were also measuring uh, a, a protein called neurofilament in the cerebral spinal fluid, which is associated with uh, the dysfunction of neurons. Um, and the hope ultimately in the long term is that this will eventually go down. And in fact, they found this short uh, window of time during the trial when actually those levels unexpectedly increased. So. No one yet knows why this has happened, or no one has said publicly why this happened. It was unexpected. It did seem to resolve, and the people who would continue to get the drug. So this tells us that we need to learn a little bit more about how ASOs interact with the brain, um, and why it why it took a little while to happen, and then why it happened, and then why it resolved. And and you can bet that a lot of people are working really hard and trying to get to the bottom of this. And it shows that we're getting really good at monitoring. You know, to be honest, this might have been happening in every time someone got dosed with an ASO, but people weren't measuring these things like neurofilament before, and now we know to look for it, and that helps us go and figure out if it's a problem and if it is what to do about it. Right, and another example, uh, Pepenimab, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but this was a trial run by Vaccinex. I'm not sure if it's running in Canada, certainly in the US, run by the Huntington Study Group. Um, and this was a phase two trial of an antibody treatment for HD. Unfortunately, that trial read out last month, and it was negative. And, you know, that's not the first negative trial we've had in HD. In fact, it's not even the hundredth negative trial we've had in HD. But the good thing is that that trial uh, tells us what we need to know. The, the drug doesn't seem to be effective for HD. And we can now focus, as we already are, on uh, drugs that are um, more likely to work and are targeting much more sort of central things like the Huntington lowering uh, drugs. Talking of which, there's even more Huntington lowering drugs coming soon. And this, uh, it, it's perhaps, I don't know if it's overstating it to say that it's perhaps the holy grail of HD research to come up with a Huntington lowering drug that can be taken as a pill. So you don't have to have injections in the spine. You don't have to have drill holes in your head. You can, you can take a pill every day or every week, a bit like I take for my excess stomach acid because I drink too much coffee and I like whiskey and I'm not gonna stop drinking either of those things. So I have to take an antacid every day. Maybe we can develop something similar for Huntington's disease. Anyway, PTC Therapeutics it was the first company to announce that it has a candidate drug um, that lowers Huntington in the brain by about 50%. And then last month, very excitingly, Novartis announced that their existing drug, which already has a name, Branaplan, is a treatment for a, a disease of children, brain disease and spine disease of children called spinal muscular atrophy. It's in trials. It's been given to hundreds of children already. So it's been tested in humans and been found safe enough to carry on in their trials. Along the way, they discovered that this drug was actually lowering the production of Huntington in humans. And this is kind of like, a, so it's like a side effect of that, that drug. Um, but it's exactly what we've been trying to do for Huntington's disease. So get used to the name Branaplan. If you need to remember it, Remember the song, whoa, Black Betty, Brown a plant, whoa, Black Betty, Brown a plant. And in case you're worried about the um, uh, about whether that song is okay to sing, I looked it up on Wikipedia and Black Betty was the name of a cannon used in uh, the American War of Independence. It was a black, big black gun that was, so it's not, it's okay to say, to sing that song. Anyway, what Novartis have announced is that they are um, starting a clinical trial in HD uh, it's going to start in next year, 2021, and there's an HD Buzz article about it already, which you can read. So we now have the full spectrum of injections of ASO, gene therapies, Unicure, Voyager, and others going into the brain directly, and at least two planned uh, trials of oral pill form Huntington lowering drugs. So this is what they call a full pipeline, strength in depth. And there's also a treatment for this concept of somatic instability, which Jeff will tell you about. Yeah, and so as Ed said, the goal of these genetic studies is twofold. First, we wanna understand the genetics of HD because we're scientists, but secondly, because we wanna find targets. And what we mean by target is a, a, a gene or a process that we think we can interfere in. Um, and this process of DNA repair turns out to be one of those. It comes out of the genetics. There are several companies that have been founded in this space, the most, um, the most advanced of which, um, in terms of their pipeline and program, is a company called Triplet Therapeutics, a small biotech company uh, in Boston. 
And triplet is going after this process of somatic instability that Ed talked about, the tendency in some cells like brain cells for the CAG repeat to grow. That process we know from the genetics and from years of studies requires the, the function of certain DNA repair proteins in the cell. And so triplet's idea is to go after those DNA repair proteins, lower their levels in, um, in vulnerable tissues, um, in brains like HD, although they have programs and other um, so-called repeat expansion diseases. Um, and that's moving really fast. Um, so they recently launched a small human study, not of a drug, um, but an observ what called observational study to try to build up some, some evidence um, that their process exists in human patients. And that's been, again, during the pandemic, fully enrolled, uh, just recently announced. So the SHIELD HD study I, I is, is like triple This first. week that they announced yeah. that it was fully recruited, yeah, so that's cool. And, and that's a drug that, um, if given early, really the, its job is keeping the HD brain as healthy as it was when you were born or trying to keep it as close to healthy as it was when you were born. So given early, this could really be something that, that is in the, in the business of preventing the, the gradual accumulation of damage. And one final announcement from us is that HD buzz uh, is changing, not in any bad way. In fact, it's changing in a way that enables it to stay the thing that you know it to be. So um, Jeff and I, looked like this when we founded HD Buzz 10 years ago. Young, uh, naive, very handsome, equ exactly equally handsome. And um, now this is what we look like. We're still exactly equally handsome, but we've changed. We are now grizzled, old, uh, cynical, and uh, uh, empty inside. Our souls have long withered away. Um, so it, we thought it was 2020. It's time to bring in some new blood. And we're pleased to announce uh, that uh, we have three new editors of HD Buzz, Leora Fox, Rachel Harding, and Sarah Hernandez, three brilliant young scientists who write and communicate science extremely well. And over the next year or so, we will basically, we're staying involved, but we're gonna be handing control of the whole HD Buzz mission uh, to them. And you'll, if you look on hdbuzz.net right now, you'll see that they're already writing and editing the bulk of articles and doing a phenomenal job. So the future's in good hands. So where does that leave all of that, leave all of us? In the words of Lady Galadriel, the quest stands on the edge of a knife. This has been a difficult year. The research has carried on, but it requires even more focus from the HD community to make sure that we continue to move in the right direction and, until HD is no longer something HD families need to worry about. In the words of Gandalf, some believe that it is only great power that can hold evil in check. I should do the voice. Some believe that it is only great power that can hold evil in check, but that is not what I have found. It is the small, everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keep the darkness at bay. Small acts of kindness and love. Um, and uh, that is what HSC is about. That is what the entire global HD community is about. Organizations like EHDN, HD Cope, HDO, all working together to support each other and to support you and everyone in a similar position uh, so that we can together change the future. Enroll HD is a small act of kindness and love that you can take part in if you're if you have any spare capacity. It's a global study that helps us understand HD and also is the platform from which future clinical trials will be recruited. If you're offered the chance to take part in, in other studies like HD Clarity, this is my study. It's an international study, but it exists to make cerebrospinal fluid available for researchers so that anyone can use it uh, to, uh, well, for good. Um, so um, please do get involved in that if you're eligible. And uh, well, you know, let's reflect on the fact that the times are not great. And Frodo said to Gandalf, I wish it need not have happened in my time, to which Gandalf said, so do I, and so do all who live to suit such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. And um, at a separate point in the movie slash book, Sam says, Frodo says to Sam, what are we holding on to, Sam? And Sam says that there's some good in the world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. Needless to say, uh, we do believe there's good in the world, and we believe that we can increase the amount of good in the world if we all uh, pull together to um, try and make uh, all of this research happen as quickly and efficiently as we can. Uh, it's difficult, but together I believe, and I think Jeff agrees that we could do it. And I think that is the limit, that is the time that we have left over. So we will uh, thank you for your attention. If Jeff wants to say anything about my <coughs> Ian McCallan impression, uh, I will fight him uh, over Zoom or in the car park of any hotel in the world. Thank you for your attention.
couldn't top it. I won't get you to do your um, Sam Gamji. So um, we're happy to take questions, and but we're going to need Kevin and uh, Shelley to help us do that. Is anyone there? Oh, Kevin says change slide. Oh, okay, questions. <laughs> I was waiting to get unmuted. So thank you so much. I was waiting to be told what to do. <laughs> I'm like, ready and go. <laughs> so thank you again, Ed and Jeff, for delivering a detailed, insightful, and I must say very fun presentation today. Um, yes, we are gonna go um, on to answering questions that you have. A reminder to everyone to submit your text questions through the questions box in the control panel. And uh, we have our first question come up here. Did Dr. Tabrizi only study young adults who were pre-onset? Thank you. Yes. So I can answer that because I was one of I was involved in that study myself. Um, yeah, that was the young adult study. So they had to be 18 or over. Um, and their CAG ha calculation had to had to predict that they were over 20 years from uh, predicted onset. So they're basically a, young, a group of young adults who are very far away from getting symptoms. Um, there also is a big study that's been done by Peg Nopoulos in Iowa uh, called the Kids HD Study, which studied a group of kids at risk of HD. And, and um, uh, so half of them will have the mutation, half won't. And there was another group of controls. So the Kids HD Study, uh, told us a lot about the very early stages and PEG is now running a, an even bigger study of children and young people um, going through life uh, even more detailed more of them funded by the uh, I think by the NIH so the US government what's left of it um, and uh, so that study will dovetail nicely with HD Yaz and then my study HD CSF follows on almost exactly from HD Yaz so between those three kids HD HDS and uh, HDCSF, we've basically, we've got spinal fluid and other fluids and other measures and imaging from more, more or less the whole lifetime in HD. And that's, like what I can tell you is that these kinds of studies where you give you give blood and CSF and you may not hear anything about it, the that's the stuff that really the drug companies use to plan their trials. So we share the data with things like, with organizations like the Critical Path Institute, which exists to, um, enable uh, clinical trials and uh, drug research to move as quickly as possible, not for profit. Um, so we share the data with them from our publicly funded research. Those data are then used by the drug companies to design the trials. So it's uh, it's all feeding into the same pipeline. Great, thank you. So the next question that we have is when these drugs come out, what is the anticipated cost? And will this be affordable for everyone? So the, the easy answer to that is it's impossible to say. The medium answer is there's no drug company in the world that wants to spend a billion dollars developing a drug that no one can afford. That's just crazy and they're not gonna do that. So ultimately the way these prices shake out tends to be that the company wants to get as much of its investment back as it can and make profit. Obviously, that's what it's there for. But um, it also wants, the, wants to get the drug to as many people as possible, because if it overprices it, then people won't buy it and the drug will sit on the shelves. People will carry on dying and no one's happy. So somewhere in the middle, there's a negotiation. And that's the long answer. The first thing is to study whether the drug works and if it works, how, how much it works. So if this, is, if this drug is amazing and one dose a year, gives you another 20 years of life, they'll be able to charge a lot for it. But if you have to have it dosed every month and it only makes a small difference to survival or to quality of life, then they probably won't be able to charge as much per dose. Um, so there's, there's a certain fixed amount, which is how much it costs to make the drug. And these are reasonably expensive drugs to make because they are essentially designer drugs mm -hmm. uh, that require specialist manufacturing and distribution and so on, and, and administration is expensive. But basically it, come, it will come down to how effective the drug is. Um, and so far, these drugs uh, that have been um, released for things like spinal muscular atrophy, they have been expensive, but they have basically been priced at the range where the healthcare systems in Europe and in the US and Canada have 
been able to provide them to the people who need them. Yeah, I would say it's worth pointing out, you know, the extreme version of that is a thing like a gene therapy, right? Like the Unicure treatment that we described. Um, and, you know, there's an equivalent example, again, in spinal muscular atrophy, where there is a successful gene therapy where kids are given one shot and these kids would otherwise die and they live. We don't know how long because it, this is ongoing, but like theoretically, they could live a relatively normal lifespan. And that's a single shot. And the drug company worked on that program for 10, 15, however many years to get to the point where they could do it. And there was a lot of uproar, including in Canada, about the price of those single shots. And it's a very tricky social question of like how we compensate drug companies for their years long effort where they're not getting any payback. And then they develop a drug that, you know, with only one treatment can change someone's life. So it's a it's a big question, but I'm hopeful it'll be sorted out. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, how would one get involved in these studies? So the answer is that uh, even if there's no, I don't know how many of these trials are recruiting now, and, and depending on where you live, there may not be trials recruiting near you. But the best way to increase your chances of being in any future trial, and there will be lots of trials coming soon, is first of all, sign up for Enroll HD and you can go to enroll-hd.org. That's a study that's funded by CHDI Foundation, a non-profit organization that exists purely to invest money in accelerating treatments for Huntington's disease. And Enroll HD is the core kind of uh, clinical initiative of CHDI Foundation. It's basically um, a squad, uh, a bench from which future clinical trial participants will be drawn. So um, take part in that. Uh, and, and along the way, hopefully find a clinic that will um, that will be running Enroll HD because the Enroll HD sites are the ones most likely to be running uh, clinical trials in future. So um, the second thing is that um, certainly the uh, I know that the Huntington Society of Canada does have a clinical trial and um, enrollment database. I don't know the exact status and address of that, Shelley. So perhaps you can chime in and, and let me know whether that's still. Uh, up to date and active, my guess is that it probably is. Yes. Yes. Okay. So if you go to the Huntington Society of Canada web website, you can find that. And, and HDSA, the American, your colleagues south of the border, do have uh, a similar thing called HD Trial Finder. Uh, I don't know whether that covers some sites in in Canada too, but certainly the Huntington Society of Canada um, does have that information. So that that, that combination, being an HD clinic take part in Enroll HD and check the Huntington Society of Canada website. I'll say one, if I can just follow up with one other thing, Ed, I, you know, a lot of times, especially, you know, I know this if for American families and also Canadian families often live really far from one of these sites. And I've yeah. had family members mm -hmm. tell me like, oh, I'm going to move next to this site so I can be part of this trial. And I would, you know, I'd strongly encourage people not to do that um, or to even kind of think down that path. Like the point is we want these trials to enroll quickly um, and complete quickly. And I think that there's likely to be enough patients near the centers in Toronto and Vancouver and the other big cities. Um, and so people, you know, in more rural areas that can't participate in the trial, it's not the only way you can participate in research. Um, being involved and being active, even being active online and helping with the community engagement, stuff like that is, is super meaningful. And I, I would encourage people not to feel like they personally have to be in a trial or else they're not participating. There's lots of ways to get involved. Yeah, exactly. The trials will get recruited. The drugs will get tested. Uh, it's great if you can help. If you can't help, maybe you can help other people. Be a be a cheerleader or be a like a mentor. Offer support, moral support. Uh, you know, retweet. You know, help people. Be a cheerleader. Be a, a wingman. Um, and uh, sooner or later, the drugs will get tested anyway. All right, that was a great answer. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, so my blood test was 17 CAGs. Does this mean that my brain count can be higher, even though technically I'm gene negative? No. As far as we know, this somatic expansion only happens if your test was positive. So basically, if you're, if you had your test will give you two numbers. If both of those are in the normal non-expanded range, then this, the gene doesn't, as far as we know, show any tendency to expand in the brain. So a negative test is always a negative test. A positive test is a positive test. And if your number's 42, that's your number. 
But what that means is sort of behind the scenes, there may be some cells in your brain that have a larger number. That was always the case. This isn't new. This isn't something that's only just started happening. Uh, it's just that we now know that that 42 in blood sometimes predicts higher counts in the brain. And it's these other funny little G uh, DNA repair genes that are probably driving it. Okay, and another uh, slightly technical question again. This one's uh, directed to Professor Ed. I participated in HD Clarity last year, but recently heard that the second round of my CF spinal fluid might not be needed. Oh, well, thank you very much for participating in HD Clarity. I love you. I don't know who you are or where you are, or I guess you're in Canada. I really appreciate it. It's incredible. Uh, Jeff's given CSF, I've given CSF, and I'm really delighted that there's people in, in the audience who have given CSF for clarity. Actually, um, we do still want uh, repeated collections of CSF, um, and I'm guessing that you're probably either in Toronto or Vancouver. Um, we're currently amending the protocol to make it um, easier and more regular for us to collect CSF from people. Now, there may be re things about your health or um, uh, medications or other stuff that have changed in the interim if so then the site pi should be able to explain why they may not be asking you to come back but but basically yeah hd clarity as a whole is going to be is rapidly turning into a study where we have something like 500 people csf from baseline and we're going to ask them to donate csf up to once a year for as long as they um, are inclined to do so but equally if they don't want to do it again that is completely fine. And we always make very good use of the CSF that is, is donated. And I promise I don't drink any of it. None of us were thinking that, literally no one. <clears throat> I said I don't drink it. Okay, so next question. Do you see advantages to getting tested earlier rather than later in order to be part of trials? Or are the trials more often being focused only on people uh, showing symptoms currently? Jeffrey, yeah, that's Brian a great question. Can I yeah. that question? Um, so I would I would say that like for me personally, it was very rewarding to get tested. Even I got tested when I was 21, um, and it was rewarding. And one of the things was I could participate in research. Um, and I thought maybe just by figuring out whether I was carrying the mutation or not would help me figure out, you know, if I needed to stay in touch with the research community and so on. And now it turns out that like with Enroll HD, there's ways for everyone to, meaningful ways for everyone to be involved in research, um, whether you want to get tested or not. So I would say that like, it's very, it's, it's very much less uh, central to me, um, the, the engagement in research for get, as a motivator for getting tested. Get tested if you personally want to get tested for your own intrinsic reasons. I wouldn't use participation research as as something to push me over the edge if I was on the fence about getting tested. It, it needs to be the right decision for you. It's, you know, it's good for the community to have a, a body of people, but right now these tests, these drugs that we're testing are, are all being tested in people who have symptoms. Uh, and that will be confirmed with a genetic test, but ultimately that person has to have, for now, has to have HD symptoms. So be, have, being another pre-symptomatic person available for testing uh, of drugs is a great future goal, but it's not something that's right now meaningful enough to the community that it should should nudge your decision one way or the other. I think do the right thing for, for you and your family. Let me just add a little caveat, if I may, from the point of view of someone who's sort of behind the scenes of what the next generation of clinical trials is gonna look like. The current, all, every drug we've mentioned today is being tested in people with symptoms. Um, and that's likely to be the same for any new drug that comes on the market or into testing, it's gonna be in people with early symptoms because those are the people in whom you can you can easily identify benefits and harms um, if, you, if you change the trajectory. However, the first big thing that the companies will want to do is get the drug licensed. If, if the trials work, they'll get the drug licensed. The next big thing they want to do, and they won't want to wait for this, is to run trials to prevent, in preve to, to prevent onset of HD in so-called pre-manifest people. So those trials, I think, will come soon, as long as one of these drugs that's lowering Huntington actually then slows progression. And, and maybe even before that happens, I think we'll see drugs in prevention trials, and those will probably require people to know their genetic status already. So I would say, I mean, Jeff, you were tested a long time before any of these trials were thought of. I would say I think it's reasonable for the the 
the fact that we expect prevention trials to be beginning in the next five to ten years, I think that, that it's reasonable for that to be one thing that you think about, along with all of the other very important stuff like family and jobs and future and your own, you know, everything. Um, I think it. I think it's okay to maybe shift you from forty nine to fifty one. I don't know. What do you think, Jeff? Tell me if I'm yeah, idiot. I mean, no, no. I, I, I think it's. I think it's a reasonable thing to think about. I just think it needs. It, it needs to be weighed much less than the intrinsic things that yeah. are good for you. And 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 it's it's a it's a community benefit, not a personal benefit, really, to be involved in research. And and the other thing is that's changed in the interim is the advancement of enroll is a really meaningful platform for engagement. Yeah. And you don't have to be tested to be an enroll. And I think. Um, if if you're just looking for a way to do research and you don't want to be tested, you can be on enroll, and that's fantastic. So the final thing to say is trial participation does not equal getting a drug that works. So if the if the current uh, no, Roche drug works, one in three people in that trial will have been given injections of placebo into the spine. Nothing injections of nothing for two years. And sure, they'll roll over into open label treatment, but the net result of their participation in that phase three trial will be two years of progression and no treatment with any drug. So these are not, it's really important to remember that being in a trial is testing the drug. And, and part of that is potentially exposing yourself to risk. You're, you're giving your body to the HD community, basically, for the duration of that trial with no, no personal expectation of benefit, but some possibility that you might be harmed. So, and, and sure, if you're lucky, you'll be on the drug and the drug will turn out to be great. But actually, uh, that, so far, that hasn't been the experience of people in HD trials. Everything that we've tested up until now hasn't worked. So, uh, it's great to want to be in trials, but it's also fine not to be in a trial or, you know, it's important to remember what the reasons are. Okay, so could you address what you know about the future of possible CRISPR-9 research in regards to HD? I'm not talking about in utero, but for people with HD mutation. I um I can at least take a first stab at that. So CRISPR um is sort of CRISPR Cas9 system that was referred to as the first um or the most advanced I would say technology in what's called genome editing. And so it's not doing um not knocking down mRNA like Ed and I were talking about with a lot of these approaches, but actually going in and modifying DNA. Um I I will be shocked if CRISPR Cas9 is used as a therapy in HD in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, it's it's an incredibly high bar for using CRISPR as opposed to these other approaches because you're making changes to someone's DNA. Um, and that has a very um, high potential for risk, right? And so it's an incredible tool and we use it in lab all the time. I'm, I have CRISPR mice in my lab. We use it daily in the lab. It's incredibly uh, empowering, advanced in the lab. As a therapeutic, it has a couple disadvantages. And one is it's difficult to deliver. Um, and two is this other, the super high risk induced by the fact that you're modifying someone's genome, basically. And, and there's going to be a really, really high bar therapeutically um, for proving that you're only making the edits that you think you're making and that you're not changing the DNA somewhere else. Um, you know, there's 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 been some some excitement about this because it sounds, you know, as an HD person or the person carrying HD mutation, like the idea of being able to go in and like actually cut out the mutation itself seems like the most amazing thing um but the practical limitations for it i think are are really difficult and it, it it's not what i'm hanging my hopes on as an hd family member uh, compared to the other things that Ed and i talked about today although it's amazing amazing scientific advance i agree okay hi jeff and end do you uh do you please can you please give an update on Voyager's approach? It was on the overview slide beside Uni Unicure. Uh, thanks and best regards from Germany. Stay safe. Yeah. Ah, hi, Germany. Guten Abend. Wie geht's? Mir geht's gut. Ich habe das Brot bei Aldi gekauft. Um, little, uh, what little he said. About, about <laughs> buying bread at the supermarket. Um, so what was the question? Voyager. Yeah, Voyager's program, uh, as far as I'm aware, is full speed ahead. I, th I think I recall that they announced um, a couple of weeks ago that they had had a slight hiccup with the FDA in that they applied for what's called an IND 
which is a license to start thinking about putting a drug into human trials. They're developing a gene therapy somewhat similar to the Unicure, but with slightly different uh, ingredients. And um, the, uh, the, the FDA responded with com some concerns about whether they were uh, whether they had the full capacity to manufacture the drug with the uh, the construct, as it were, with the necessary purity and consistency and ensure supply chain. We, I'm assured by Voyager that this is a purely sort of technical thing. Uh, it's a, it, it's a, 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 they expect it to be no more than a, a brief setback. The fundamentals of the program, I'm told, are sound. And Voyager is still planning to launch, to uh, go ahead with FDA approval and to launch a clinical trial um, in what I think they've described as the very near future. So they they had hoped to get the IND approval this year. I think it's probably going to be early next year. And if things go well, we should see patients dose next year in that program. Okay. And I am curious if there are any benefits to natural supplements that have been proven beneficial, CBD, THC, vitamins, turmeric, curcurum. Perkerman, I I can't say it. Perkerman. Perkerman, Jeff. Can you guys say it? We got it. Uh, Perkerman, I think. But um, so I'll just I'll I'll start with this. I don't take any supplements. Um, and you know when I first found out about my HD mutation, I did. Um, you know I took blueberries and creatine. Thought about. I think I went through a few phases where I took coenzyme Q10, but that's very expensive. Um, and I'll say that, like, my logic of the time was like, well, these things are generally beneficial, at least in some settings, and they can't hurt. But in fact, they can. And, and you know, there's much less high standards for manufacturing for these things than there is for drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and I was realizing I was taking like 30 grams a day of creatine, which is not a drug. It's like a milkshake. You know, that's like a lot of. And then I was thinking, where, who's making this 30 grams of creatine and, you know, which factory is it being made in and who's who's keeping standards and it, there just really aren't very good standards and more to the point in the subsequent intervening years you know the most promising of those coenzyme q10 and creatine in terms of the mouse studies that justified people being interested in them had massive human studies done and both of them failed badly like no sign of efficacy with either of those and in parallel there's been some other efforts that make me a little concerned so you know, for a while, everybody was taking high doses of vitamin E. You know, there's always vitamin X is always the vitamin of the month. Um, and there was a massive study run, not in HD patients, but just in um, in aging women, I think it was. And they found that like strong uh, use or use of high doses of vitamin E chronically was actually associated with increased mortality in this large cohort of women. And so it's just, there's like unexpected side effects with biology and the more biology I learn, the more cautious and conservative I get. And right now I'll say definitively, there, there is no evidence in the kind of standard that we talked about, which is a randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind study. There is no evidence that any supplement will slow the progression of HD. So personally, the risk-reward characteristics for me don't justify trying to take supplements right now. But I mean, not to say okay. one shouldn't, but that's that's my story. Cannabis and CBD are possibly a little bit different, though, because I think... For one thing, the research into those comp those are those are psychoactive compounds, which is what we call a drug that works on the brain. And 99% of drugs that are developed for brain diseases fail because they don't work on the brain. So we know that cannabis and product uh, molecules that come from cannabis do work on the brain, which is why people take them. I, I've I've certainly met lots of people with you know things like anxiety or movements in HD, where taking those molecules in one form or another illegally and legally now in many places um, has for them been beneficial um, and yeah we don't have the evidence in large clinical trials in fact all of the evidence that we have for cannabis and cannabis compounds uh, has failed to show overall benefit but that doesn't mean that they can't be beneficial in, in certain people and really a lot of the drugs that we use for symptom control in HD um, which are you know conventional prescription drugs we know they work uh, and the way we know they work is we prescribe them and the symptom gets better and the, when we see the patient next they tell us that they're moving less and sleeping better and they're happier um, but trials haven't been run of, of things like antipsychotics to treat movement disorder in HD so to a large extent I think the cannabis I don't know would uh, personally I would say if, 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 if you find it beneficial 
to consume a cannabis compound and if you have a reliable outcome measure in other words if you're treating a particular symptom and this compound helps you with that symptom and if the people around you agree and if the, there isn't an obvious downside that outweighs the advantages then to me as a doctor it seems reasonable to carry on taking that compound and but that's that's not the same as taking something where you don't feel any different from one day to the next um, but and you're taking it in the hope that it will protect your neurons against ongoing damage so i think there is a distinction there between the, the supplements that people have historically taken to try and keep their brain cells alive there's no evidence for any of those working versus drugs or compounds that people can take uh, that make a measurable difference to symptoms and those symptoms can be seen to be better as a result of taking those drugs would you does that reasonable jeff yeah no no i think you're right okay and next question what is a realistic time frame for a drug to go through all required required trials be approved and then available for distribution Hmm. Well, it depends if you have a coronavirus vaccine. If, if you do, then it's probably about two weeks. Um, the SMA drug, the, the, the first ASO drug that worked, uh, which is a drug called Nusin, um, was uh, the trial results came out in, I think, September, and the drug was licensed on Christmas Eve by the FDA. So that was about three months. And it was available for, for prescribing in the US the following spring. So it took about six months. Um, that was, you know, a drug that's going to save the lives of, of dying children. Um, and in, the, in Europe, it took about two years longer than that because of the fact that the healthcare systems there are um, uh, socialized, i.e. the government has to pay for the drugs. And that means that the company has to prove the, the case that the drugs are worth the money that's being asked for. Um, that took too long. And I would hope that um, the case for an HD drug, because HD is reasonably common, and it's obvious that HD is um, an expensive thing for healthcare systems to look after. Um, I would think that I would hope that it would be quicker. Um, so I, I can't give any figures um, because we, uh, you know, again, it will depend on how obviously effective the drugs are. If the drug is a complete home run, then the process should be quick. If the if the evidence is borderline, it might take a lot longer. But I can tell you that the the other thing to say there is that the companies are already planning how to do that stuff so they've gone through this process enough times and rush is huge they've got loads of drugs licensed including drugs for diseases that cause neurological disability so they know how to do it they also are doing the homework in parallel so it won't surprise them like it might surprise a smaller drug company when the drug passes if the drug passes the trials that the governments then turn around and say prove that the drug is worth the amount you're asking for because roche is doing these real world data studies to basically try and figure out and demonstrate what the <clears throat> financial cost of Huntington's disease is per patient per year. And then they can show, well, this is the benefit of the drug and this is how much we're asking for. So, um, you know, that it's safe to say if the trials work, the drug companies will hit the ground running and they know, um, they know what they're already generating the data that's needed, to, not only to show that the drug works, but also to show that it's worth uh, funding and it's worth uh, rolling out in healthcare systems. And just just one final point on that: the the only drug for which we can have any kind of semi-definitive timeline is the drug that's already in what's called a phase three or like a, a late stage trial powered to actually prove the drug works. And the only drug in that status right now in HD is the the Roche Ionis drug, the the Tom Anderson trial. And so that you know we know unless something goes incredibly bad or incredibly well before the end of the trial that will end um in uh spring of 2022 um and you know none of the other drugs are at that stage yet and and sometimes the delays between trials of the early safety study and the later study are variable so just because unicure has started a safety study doesn't mean we know exactly when the large pivotal study would read out so it's only the it's only the roche study that we have this somewhat um accurate sense of what the timeline will be oh you've been joined by a guest Yes, I, I know it looks like I've got a glove puppet with like a, a prosthetic human hand incorporated in it, but this is my dog Riley, who is the smallest possible dog, basically a, a baby. All We're right. happy to answer any more questions. 
No, that seems to be uh, the last of the questions for today. So if anyone has any further questions at a later time, uh, you can feel free to email them to events at huntingtonsociety.ca and we'll pass those along to Ed and Jeff on your behalf and return to you with their responses. So thanks again to both uh, Jeff and Ed for your wonderful uh, enlightening presentation. We appreciate the valuable insights you've shared and that you're giving uh, of your time yet again on behalf of the community. It's our pleasure. Thanks. I hope Lovely to here. be able to hang out with you guys in better times than in person and Absolutely. in the second, the second age of mankind in which we can hug again. <laughs> Ditto. All right. If we can take care. If we can, if, if we can just advance the slide. Oh yeah, sure. We just want to talk about our next forum. Perfect. So the next community education forum is on February 27th, 2021, where Claire Gibbons will be discussing genetic testing. So you can register online at www.huntingtonsociety.ca forward slash CEF. And even if you cannot join us uh, live, pre-registration means that you will be sent the recording after the fact again. And then one more move on the slides. As we're sharing here. Um, so we're going to talk for a moment about FlipGiv. So HSC has started a new fundraising uh, initiative through FlipGiv that we're very excited about. It involves a website and um, an app that has partnerships with major retailers across Canada uh, that provide retailer donations uh, directly to HSC for your everyday purchases um, that you make through their website or app. So what this means is that you and your friends can drive donations directly to HSC uh, for free uh, just by using the app to do your everyday shopping. So we've just launched this a, a couple of weeks ago and so, for, so far we've raised uh, close to $1,000 um, and uh, we anticipate with Christmas shopping right around the corner that uh, we're going to be able to provide significant support to the organization through this uh, fun opportunity. So you can sign up at www.hscflipgive.ca. And in closing, we just want to uh, thank everyone again. I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, part two of our three-part community education forum series. Um, we'd like to thank our speakers, uh, Professor Ed Wild and Dr. Jeff Carroll, one last time. And on behalf of the Huntington Society of Canada, I'd also like to thank the audience for taking the time to join this session. Please feel free to share your feedback with the events team so that we can make future webinars uh, even better. And remember to follow us on social media to see latest HSC updates. So again, thank you all so much and we hope that you have a wonderful weekend and uh, goodbye everyone.